Starting at number 10, we have General Zod. This Kryptonian supervillain flaunts the same powers as Superman, but he's also got the know-how of a highly experienced army general, having held the title of Leader of Military Defense for the Science Council on Krypton. General Zod survived the destruction of Krypton and, after being released from the Phantom Zone, became a sworn enemy to Superman. This supervillain is fueled, like many others, by resentment and rage, believing that violence is the only way to make any real change in the world. I put him at the back of our list not to discount his powers, but purely because there are far more powerful beings to come. Number 9. Doomsday. This hyper-regenerative creature was created in a lab and designed to experience death over and over and over again, each time evolving past whatever had killed him the last time. Starting off as a seemingly regular baby, he has grown into a monstrosity that has experienced death so many times that he's become a tormented and I imagine exhausted creature that actually holds on to the memories of each experience. So imagine facing the pain of death almost endlessly for eternity, mostly inflicted by superheroes trying to rid the universe of you. You'd be pretty angry too. Doomsday even faces off against and defeats Superman at one point, so his power is not to be underestimated. But he just can't contend with some of the other godlike powers that other villains on this list possess. So, for that reason, he's a bit further back on the list, but once again, not to be discounted. At number eight, we have Hela, the eldest daughter of Odin. Hela is endowed with powers superior even to her younger brothers Loki and Thor most notably credited with effortlessly shattering Thor's hammer with one hand, this supervillain easily has the ability to rule not only the world, but the whole cosmos. Gila is basically a god, having a set of abilities that practically make her entirely omnipotent, with super strength, super durability, and immortality as long as Asgard existed, omnipresent, with super speed and super reflexes, and omniscient, with her almost endless knowledge of sword and hammer fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, acrobatics, and military strategy. If anyone is capable of not only overpowering any good guys standing in her way, but also outsmarting them, it's Hela. Okay, at number seven, we've got the one and only Thanos. Probably the most widely popular on the list, it's not hard to imagine him taking over and ruling the world for obvious reasons. But I know some of you may be shocked to see him at number seven and not at number one, two, or three, because despite his undeniable strength and motivation to balance out the population of the universe, he wasn't able to do it alone. As we all know, Thanos' peak power relies on the Infinity Stones. So if he failed to obtain them, he may never have had the chance to be on this list at all. And as for his ability to rule the world, the best way I could see that happening would be through fear, keeping his enemies at bay by threatening to use the stones. But once the snap took place, he would still have half the universe to face if he were to try to take over the world. And that's sort of what happens, isn't it? He was tracked down and executed by Thor and the remaining Avengers. And whether we'd like to admit it or not, this shows, I know this sounds wrong, but a weak spot that other villains on this list just don't have. So Thanos is definitely capable of ruling the world as we know it, but there's an asterisk might need to undergo a bloody conquest to retrieve Infinity Stones first. At number six, we've got Darkseid, born as Euxus, Uxus, Euxus, probably Euxus, with royal status on the planet of Apocalypse. Darkseid was born with supreme power to his father Yuga Khan and mother Hegra. Posing as one of the primary threats in most Superman storylines, Darkseid dedicates his life to taking life away. His main accolade came when he came in contact with the Martians, who shared with him the life equation, at which point Darkseid in all his evil glory theorized that there must be an anti-life equation as well. Google the equation if you want, it's a real bummer. Yeah, so basically, <laughs> Darkseid is a bad dude, but who isn't on this list? What really sets him apart from the others is his ability to cheat death. When he's seemingly killed in a battle with his son Orion, his life force is able to live on past the destruction of his body and come back to get revenge killing Orion with a time-traveling bullet. If I wanted to continue exploring all of Darkseid's evil accolades, this part of the video would be 20 minutes long. So I'll just say this, Darkseid is more than capable of taking over the world, having had plenty of experience on Apocalypse. In fact, if he wasn't so obsessed with the anti-life equation, he probably would have done it 10 times over. 
at least. At number five, we have Superboy Prime. This young supervillain comes from a version of Earth, Earth Prime, where he is the only superhero in existence. He grew up loving the DC Universe, very meta, yes, particularly the Silver Age. But like ours, unfortunately, in his dimension, all these heroes are merely fiction, except for him. But after his home world is destroyed along with many other versions of Earth, by what is known as Crisis on Infinite Earths, he becomes more and more angry and resentful about the loss of his old life and turns to the dark side, killing many heroes and villains in his way. Now, he is after all credited, should I use that word? With defeating the Justice League, Earth 2 Superman, and the Teen Titans among others, and shattering none other than Anti-Monitor's armor. But since we're talking about ruling the world purely by his somewhat naive, angst-fueled view on reality, he might not be able to maintain rule over the world for long. But nonetheless, this super house of a villain has the perfect balance of dimension-shattering power, insecurity, and resentment to force his way into a position of supreme reign over the world as we know it. Okay, at number four, we've got Yuga Khan, the all-powerful first ruler of Apocalypse who was for a long time, considered the most powerful being in the universe. Father to Darkseid, this ruler fits right into our list because we're talking about not just powerful beings, which Yuga Khan undoubtedly is, but villains that could rule the world. And Yuga Khan had a lot of experience ruling over Apocalypse. His only downfall was that he wanted more power, which proved to be impossible. His attempt to uncover the source, which is defined as the cause of life itself, or the meaning of life, if you will, eventually destroyed him. This proved that even the most powerful being in the world was no match for the limits of the universe. However, it does still say a lot that his insatiable thirst for power was the only cause for his downfall because that very trait that Yuga Khan possesses is the very thing that would land him on this list. I mean, let's be honest, the first ruler of Apocalypse would have no problem ruling over our world as we know it, would he? I don't think so. Gosh, this is getting hard. To be honest, these top threes could basically be interchangeable. At number three, we have Galactus. Galactus is basically an interplanetary, interdimensional being that feeds on, yep, you got it, life. I'm sure you've seen this guy before on TV and comics in your nightmares. There's just something about him that makes me feel afraid for my life probably the part where he wants to consume it. Throughout the years in the Marvel Universe, Galactus has made many appearances, moving between worlds, taking what he wants, and often leaving planets bare of any life. What's terrifying and powerful about Galactus is that it's not like he's driven by some sort of anger or hatred for humanity and other life in the universe. He's just hungry. Every time he reappears with a vengeance, it's as though he's just trying to satiate a hunger that even he can't control. So if you were going to ask me if I think he could take over the world, I would say yes. If he could eat the world, he can rule it, I imagine. This guy is so powerful that when the Silver Surfer manages to turn Galactus's own energy siphoning machines against him, his true form is revealed to be a sentient star. So there's no real contest here with how powerful this villain is. The only asterisk I may put here is that in the context of this list, there's a chance that he doesn't pull off a very steady reign over civilization because as soon as he gets that insatiable hunger for life again, he'll have no world to rule. Number two on our list goes to Anti-Monitor, born on one of the moons of an evil dimension called Quard. Anti-Monitor is basically the manifestation of evil. He was created billions of years ago after a scientist named Krona tried to witness the origins of life itself. So he was created from, arguably, one of the original events that brought evil into the universe. Then there was a million year war with his good counterpart known as, you guessed it, Monitor. The results which was a draw. Boring. Then they both fell unconscious for 9 billion years. Even more boring. But the rest of this villain story is anything but boring. After his hibernation, he wakes up and destroys a whole universe. One of many in the future. You know why? Because another scientist, this one named Pariah, tried to observe the origins of the universe again. Anyway, Anti-Monitor becomes infinitely stronger from this, having created an antimatter universe and sets out to wreak more havoc. This guy belongs right at the top of the list because he seems to only appear when the very essence of evil is released into the universe. He's huge, he literally eats universes for breakfast, and as a little added bit to the resume, he's known as being pretty good at leadership, having led an army of Cordians and 
shadow demons on his conquest to take down whole universes. There's so much more to Anti-Monitor's story, and even though it sort of ends when Superman 2 kills him, I would argue that a villain that can consume whole universes could, if he so pleased, make a pit stop and rule the world for a bit. Maybe get bored of that, go and rule another world for a bit, and still make it home for dinner. And what would be for dinner, you ask? Probably another universe. There's no touching this guy. The only reason why I don't give him a number one spot is only because even though he'd be able to rule the world with ease, he'd probably not even choose to do so. His ambitions go way beyond conquering planets, so I mean, would his lack of interest be the very thing that got in the way of successfully taking over our tiny world? I'll leave that up to you guys. All right, at number one, we have a villain that ticks off all the boxes. He's extremely powerful, interdimensional, very, very evil, and has more mortal-like ambitions that would and have set his sights on ruling our world. And that is... Kang the Conqueror. Now, I know what you're thinking. This guy isn't a universe destroyer. Okay, but remember, this is a list about the top 10 villains who could rule the world. And out of everyone in the Marvel Universe, Kang is arguably the most powerful evil villain who deals primarily with earthly ambitions. He's able to travel through time like it's part of his daily routine, constantly posing as a major threat to the Avengers and the Fantastic Four, and constantly manipulating the outcome of events on Earth and beyond due to his superior hindsight. But beyond that, his resume is insane. Having already conquered thousands of worlds over a 100 light year conquest, destroying Washington DC, killing his own son, killing his own lover, trying to kill baby versions of the Avengers, and even killing past versions of himself, all to get to his final goal. Kang really stops at nothing to get what he wants, ignoring his love for even his closest allies and family members, and altering the course of multiple realities to see any outcome he desires. Also, he killed his lover because he was in limbo and basically got bored. This villain is the manifestation of fate. He chooses what happens in the world, and unlike the second on our list, he has many human-like traits that I would argue make him even more evil. There were early versions of Kang that were actually good, like Rama Tut and Mortis and Iron Lad, but he chose evil over good, and actively uses his almost infinite power to kill countless people and mutants from the Marvel Universe as well. Almost all of them at one point. He's ruthless, has an evil tyrannous king, Henry VIII vibe, and would easily set his sights on our world if he so chose. And he has chosen many times before, in many different timelines. At number 10, we have Annihilus. Using the cosmic control rod, Annihilus ameliorates his own well-being, spending most of his time trying to find ways to make himself, yes, immortal. The rod is known to have almost limitless capabilities, so his efforts aren't in vain, as he has found ways to fend off disease, slowing down cellular degeneration, otherwise known as aging, and warding off heat and cold. He also uses it to fly super fast, which is another plus. The only reason why Annihilus is back at number 10 for me is that he seems to need the cosmic control rod to achieve immortality. And even while he has it, he's known to be liable to make big mistakes due to his paranoia that others are going to try and snatch it from him. Remember kids, the real superpower is up here. Number nine goes to Apocalypse. This villain, often facing off against the X-Men, originated in ancient Egypt, giving hints that he's capable of existing for hundreds of years at a time without meeting death. Yeah, so he's also known to have some supreme control over his body from an atomic level, being capable of growing in size and density whenever he chooses, and adapting to his environment and fighting off disease. Not only that, but he's immune to aging. Aging, again. So when Apocalypse was finally defeated by Cable, he wasn't actually killed and regenerated in a tomb in Aqaba. So there you have it. It seems like this guy will always be around. Our best bet is to keep him at bay for a while before he inevitably comes back, possibly repeating this process for eternity. All right, at number eight, we have Mephisto, a demon creature who presents similarly to how humans view Satan. And yes, he did this to manipulate our singular views of evil through our tale of Satan the fallen angel. Regardless, Mephisto is known to be so powerful that he does not need food or water or even oxygen to survive. He even has abilities to regenerate in the instances that he is damaged 
going as far as regrowing limbs. And he can also see his own future if he so chooses. So even if something was coming his way that could somehow usurp his seemingly immortal powers, he would see it coming and put a stop to it before it could reach him. Mephisto proves to be a threat throughout the ages, and although he does face certain limitations to his powers and influence, this list isn't about power, but about immortality. So there you go. Number seven, we've got Anti-Monitor. Yes, this villain appears a lot on these powerful villain super lists, but I couldn't ignore him on this one even if I tried. His influence in the comics is immense, but what places him in this list is primarily his near infinite age. This guy was born in the early days of the cosmos, lived for over 9 billion years in a dormant state, and even fought a battle with his counterpart, Monitor, for a million years. It's hard enough for most beings to live that long, let alone be in a constant battle the whole time. And on top of all this, he's also just proven to be nearly impossible to kill. Even when he's vanquished for good, he isn't really killed, but instead broken up into molecules and scattered through the universe. And he had to be punched into a star to make that happen. By Superman from Earth 2. With the help of Darkseid, Superboy Prime, Dr. Light, and Heroic Lex Luthor. So I'd argue that Anti-Monitor definitely deserves a spot on this list. Number six on our list goes to the one and only Kang the Conqueror. This villain is so powerful that he's able to change the course of history with little to no effort. His ability to traverse through time gives him supreme insight and also the capability to appear in any time in the history of our universe, future, past, and present. He's a real contender for this list because although he's been defeated in the past, he was really only in a state of limbo and he never truly meets a final end. I mean. He's able to not only design the outcome of reality in most cases, but also just exist in any time he'd like. He once lived in ancient Egypt, and also the turn of the 20th century. The point is, Kang shows time and time again that he's capable of existing in multiple times throughout history, which I would argue could be a form of immortality. As Schrodinger's logic would go, Kang has and hasn't existed at every moment in history and the future. It would just be up to us to observe him, and well, good luck with that. All right, at number five, I'm putting Dormammu. Am I pronouncing that right? Another villain who's been around for countless millennia, possibly even millions of years. Dormammu proves to be powerful enough and durable enough to possibly be considered immortal. One piece of evidence is his clash with Agamotto, a spawn of one of the elder gods where Dormammu actually held his own. And for those of you who don't know, Agamotto easily contended against Galactus himself. And if that wasn't enough to suggest Dormammu's potential for immortality, he's also immune to aging and harm of any kind, physical or mystical. His powers have also been used for resurrection in the past, so it's fair to say that stopping this guy will be tough and arguably won't be permanent in any case. Okay, at number four, we're looking at Searcher, the thousand foot tall fire giant who can move stuff with his mind. Searcher was the sworn enemy of Odin and Thor and eventually destroys Asgard. At a few points, Searcher is imprisoned and banished, but never completely destroyed. Even after one of these instances where Searcher was transported to the sea of eternal light and frozen for all time, he still re-emerges after a Norwegian guy named Sven finds a medallion with connections to Searcher and subsequently turns into him. Thank you so much, Fen. And once again, when he's finally defeated by the Asgardians, he isn't really, since he just finds himself resurrected in a realm called Muspelheim. There's one instance where he's then beheaded by the Twilight Sword, another where he's basically destroyed by Odin who steals the eternal flame from him, but based on his track record, I'm not buying that any of these instances are the last of him. We're in the top three, folks, and at number three we have none other than Thanos. I know, yes, in the movies he was beheaded, but many argue that this isn't the end of him. Thanos is an ancient Eternal who was born on the planet Titan to his father Alars, also an Eternal. So, this dates Thanos back about a million years. And Thanos himself is an Eternal, meaning we can at least deduct that he's immune to all disease and aging. In fact, Thanos was specifically banned by death from his realm, meaning it's almost confirmed that he can't be killed. So yeah, in the movie, spoiler alert, should have said that by now, we all saw him die. But by the laws of this character's storyline, this won't be the last we see of Thanos. 
no matter how severe the injury appears to be. Number two, we've got the insatiable Galactus. This bad guy is hardly a villain anymore and more like a floating entity that feeds on the energy of life forms. Interdimensional and one of the oldest known beings to ever exist, Galactus always finds a way to bring evil to the cosmos. Even in his apparent death, he was replaced by Abraxas who basically took over in his absence. As much as Galactus is able to endure and despite his nearly infinite age, there are instances where he's weakened and put into submissive positions by other forces in the cosmos. The closest he comes to truly dying is when Thor and Galactus' attempted assault on the Black Winter goes horribly wrong and Thor turns on him, leaving him on the brink of death. A little too late I'd say, considering you just let him consume five planets, Thor, but also good on you for killing Galactus sooner or later. But does Galactus ever die? Not really. Let's just hope that Abraxas doesn't come back again while he's gone. We don't want that. That guy's no good either. At number one, we have the Goblin Entity. This being was created at the point of the Big Bang, so one of the oldest on our list for sure. That said, the power of this villain has sustained over billions of years, and just like Galactus, it is driven by its insatiable hunger for energy. It's basically a giant, dark entity that moves through the cosmos, ingesting everything in its way. It is confirmed that the goblin entity cannot die, and if it were to be killed, similarly to everyone else on this list, it would find a way to regenerate. It seems what we're dealing with in this top 10 is a group of villains that just won't stop, no matter how hard you try to defeat them. But perhaps by exploring the villains with potential immortality, we're also exploring the deepest depths of true metaphorical evil found in the DC and Marvel universes. In that, in the real world as well, evil does always find its way back into the world. And all that can be done about it is temporary. Although those moments are sweet, where good wins, it's not long before we have to prepare for evil to return and rear its ugly head again. Number 10, Nightmare. Nightmare is one of the fear lords who rules over the nightmare dimension of the dream dimension of the splinter dimensions of the dark dimensions. Nightmare rules over the nightmare dimension, which is where people go when they have nightmares. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. He is a fear lord, one of these guys. And he first appeared in Strange Tales 110, which is also the first appearance of Stephen Strange. So if you thought we were not covering Nightmare, you thought wrong. In the follow-up Doctor Strange story, the world is destroyed, and Doctor Strange goes to seek the help of Eternity, who is the physical embodiment of the Marvel Universe, only to find Nightmare captured Eternity in the dream dimension and subjected him to horrible dreams. Because Nightmare's powers are fueled by humans, it took a battle between the Ancient One and Eternity to convince Eternity to reform the Earth and human civilization. That's how scary nightmares are! He shows up occasionally, tormenting heroes in their dreams, and leaving his realm to depower him so that heroes can actually defeat him. Usually, it's Doctor Strange doing the hard work inside other people's dreams, though. Number 9, Kulin Gath. Kulin Gath was a sorcerer who lived in Earth's Hyborian era, aka the time of Conan the Barbarian. He actually isn't the original Kulin Gath, though. Well, he is, and he isn't. See, Kulin had a slave who poisoned him and assumed his identity. When this Kulin Gath set out the training of the then Sorcerer Supreme, Mekri Ra, he was refused. He responded by murdering and consuming the Sorcerer Supreme, gaining his power. As an enemy of Conan, Kulin was eventually beheaded by the Barbarian, but not before he had become immortal by putting his essence in a magical amulet. It's... That's a Horcrux! After the amulet had made its way to Manhattan in the modern era, it ended up in the hands of a mugger who donned the amulet, allowing Kulin Gath to possess and transform the body of the mugger. Then, he transformed Manhattan into a replica of the time he came from, manipulated the minds of everyone there, and took control of the minds of the Avengers, X-Men, New Mutants, and Morlocks to hunt down Spider-Man. It took the combined powers of Doctor Strange and the mutant magic to change time so that the mugger was killed by Nimrod instead. You know you're a problem when people just go back in time to take you out. Number eight, Loki. At this point, I'm pretty sure everyone and their mom has heard of the god of mischief, Loki. If not from the MCU, then at least from the actual Norse mythology. So I'm not gonna go into a huge backstory spiel, but do you know how actually powerful Loki is? Obviously he is a god, and the number of benefits that come with that title are, well, he doesn't really need a plan, let's just say that. He is super strong, super durable, super fast, he's got a healing factor, and he lives for a hell of a long time. But more than that, Loki himself is an extremely powerful sorcerer. So powerful, in fact, that Loki even recently took on the role of Sorcerer Supreme through a little of his trickster ways. Let me tell you, 
It took Stephen Strange harnessing the full power of the World Tree Yggdrasil, plus the strength of the Sentry and more prominently the Void, which is capable of destroying Asgard and has even killed Loki in the past, for Doctor Strange to get the mantle back. Needless to say, Loki is an extremely powerful villain for most characters in the Marvel Universe, but as a sorcerer, he is a pain in the backside of our Sorcerer Supreme. Number 7. Baron Mordo You know that guy who is basically Stephen Strange's sidekick in the first movie? Yeah, yeah, that guy. That's Mordo. So Mordo was born in Transylvania, basically as a means of another sorcerer, this dude, gaining power. And when that all went kaput, Mordo was trained in the ways of black magic. At the age of 30, he went to Tibet to find and study with the Ancient One. And it's here that he eventually met our lovely boy Steven. Mordo didn't really dig Strange though. And when Steven walked in on Mordo doing some nefarious planning to attack his master, Mordo cast a spell to stop Steven from warning Baldi. He's the bad guy though, and this is the origin story of Doctor Strange, so you can imagine how it didn't go too well for him. Steven became the Sorcerer Supreme, and Mordo left, continuing his studies of dark magic on his own time. He has always been a long time rival to Strange, and the Ancient One, causing all kinds of mischievous activity, helping other villains like Dormammu, and joining multiple different mystic teams. As another powerful sorcerer, he has many abilities and spells equal to Doctor Strange, except Except he's got a fair dose of the old black magic, which is always a problem for bad guys. I'm super excited to see what part he plays in the Multiverse of Madness, especially with that hair. Damn, boy! Number 6. Doctor Doom He's got arguably the best lines in Marvel Comics. He rules Latveria. His mother sacrificed her soul to the devil to make him a monarch. He's got a huge ego, but not for no reason. I don't think there is a hero that hasn't come into some kind of contact with Doctor Doom, although he is primarily a Fantastic Four villain. His use of magic, though, brings him into interaction with the Sorcerer Supreme so many times. Doctor Doom was introduced to sorcery through his mother, but received a huge power boost when he sacrificed the soul of his former lover, Valeria, to the Hazareth Three, who in return granted him magical armor made of Valeria's skin and flesh. Couldn't be me. With their power and his own sorcery, Doom can create mystical blasts and force fields, invoke entities, cast more powerful spells, reverse other spells, summon demonic hordes, teleport, travel to other dimensions, mystical ensnaring in portals, magically heal himself and others, banish others, time travel, absorb power, manipulate elements, perform telekinesis, nullify others' powers. And I think that's the list. But other than his sorcery, he is a super genius in the vein of Tony Stark, even eventually becoming Iron Man for a while. He's a master martial artist, he is at peak human condition, he's got great connections, he's super charismatic, and just plays the piano like a pro. His biggest weakness is that damn ego. But there was a point in time where he was known as God Emperor Doom when he used the power of the Beyonders to create and rule over Battleworld, making the Sorcerer Supreme his sheriff. Like I said, he kind of has a right to possess such an ego. I mean, just look at him! Number 5. Mephisto Mephisto has always been somewhat of a background character, jumping up here and again in Marvel Comics, but with no real huge events to his name, although he has been a part of a few. Mephisto is an extremely powerful extra-dimensional demon who very closely resembles the devil, but that may only be because it's the easiest way for him to use people's fears to his advantage. Mephisto's calling card is making bets, but they're never fair wagers. He always seems to get people in the wording of his deals. He'd probably make one hell of a lawyer. Usually Mephisto is asking people to put their souls or the souls of those they love on the line. Like with Doctor Doom's mother or Johnny Blaze, or most recently when he and Doctor Strange had a bet that people weren't all that bad in exchange for Doctor Strange's soul. That kind of thing. In his own dimension, the Hell Lord is basically omnipotent. Although he can be defeated by someone who is smart enough or powerful enough. As a mystical entity, he's been a long time foe of the Sorcerer Supreme. And his most recent story, involving a hotel he sprouted up in the middle of Las Vegas, is just so quirky and fun. Number 4. Umar Umar of the Faultine is an insanely powerful being who is the sister of Dormammu. Umar ended up having a little bow chicka wow wow with Dormammu's disciple Orini, which led to Umar giving birth. The sweet miracle of birth changed Umar making her incapable of turning back into her faulting form, depowering her significantly. This kinda drove her crazy and she lashed out at everyone, including her much 
much more powerful brother who banished her to a pocket dimension of the dark dimension. Quite the falling out. She loves her brother though, so when he's defeated by Doctor Strange and she's freed from her banishment, she goes on to try and avenge her brother. When she went to Earth to destroy it, however, she was defeated by another extremely powerful entity. But before we get on to that guy, I just wanted to say a quick thanks for watching from me and us here at Top 10 Nerd. I hope you're enjoying the video. If you are, why not give us a little like and tap that subscribe button? You are the reason we can do what we do. I love you guys. All right, on to top three. Number three, Zom. When the aforementioned Umar invaded Earth and Doctor Strange could not defeat her, he needed some way to put her down. The Ancient One told Doctor Strange about the 20 foot, 18,000 pound interdimensional being, Zom. Doctor Strange was like, okay, perfect, I'll just go summon him, which he did, and Zom easily defeated Umar. But now he's free, and no one wants to be put back in the mystical slammer, so he turns on the Doctor. Zom is so powerful that there was absolutely nothing Doctor Strange could do. Even if all the reality warping heroes and all the Avengers combined forces, they would not be able to defeat Zom. It took the power of the Living Tribunal, the literal judge of the multiverse, who had not even been seen in Marvel Comics before this point, to whisk him away. And then the Tribunal scolded Doctor Strange for summoning a being who could literally wipe out the multiverse. He threatened to destroy Earth. It was that intense. Zom has no other goal than to completely annihilate and destroy everything, ever. Zom is one of the most powerful mystical entities in the entire Marvel Universe. And the Living Tribunal is the only person who has been shown to stop him. Number two, Dormammu. Dormammu is one of a race of extra-dimensional energy beings called the Faultine. Him and his sister Umar are both mutants of the species, seeking to consume matter instead of energy, which, along with killing their pops, caused them to be banished. They both traveled to the Dark Dimension and eventually took it over, but we know what happened to their relationship afterwards. Dormammu is the prime enemy of the Vishanti, the gods who give the Sorcerer Supreme his supreme merch, and is stated by Odin to be his equal in power. He is basically immortal and indestructible because of his energy body. He is more powerful than even the greatest sorcerers, including Doctor Strange and the Ancient One, and he can banish anyone from his domain, the Dark Dimension, but usually fights them for a bit of the old sport. He also has super strength, astral projection, matter transmutation, interdimensional teleportation, flight, can change his appearance and size, he can control the elements, time travel, and project and absorb energy. He's also immortal and has a regenerative healing factor. Dormammu first appeared in Strange Tales number 126 when he threatened the Ancient One with an invasion. The old guy sent Doctor Strange to the Dark Dimension to face Dormammu. The eventual fight set mindless ones loose, causing Dormammu and Strange to team up. Dormammu promised not to invade Earth, but he got all bitter and petty and has been one of Strange's most fearsome enemies since. He's faced almost everyone on this list. Number one, Shumagorath. Shumagorath is one of the greatest of the leaders of the Old Ones, also known as the Many Angled Ones, which are a race of nightmare fuel. Think Lovecraft, so tentacles and madness and all that jazz. It is the ruler of hundreds of dimensions and is said to be older than the universe itself. It has many mystical powers, including the ability to communicate and control others across dimensions, create mystical energy blasts from his eyes and tentacles, and can transmute things on a planetary scale. He can destroy multiple galaxies with his aura pressure and can destroy realities by using his tentacles to create a ball of energy that he launches at realities. I'm sorry, uh, does anyone else find the word tentacles funny? Anyone? They first fully premiered in Marvel Premiere Volume 1, Number 10. In the comic, they end up using the mind of the Ancient One, Doctor Strange's mentor, as a portal to the dimension of Earth. Doctor Strange goes into the Ancient One's mind to battle the defenses of Shumagorath and fight his way into its realm, only to realize that the only way to win is to kill the Ancient One. He's forced to do it. Coming in at number 10, we have the She-Hulk villain Abominatrix, who surprisingly enough doesn't actually have a connection with the more well-known villain, the Abomination, despite apparently being a gender-flipped version of him. Born under the name of Florence Sharples, Florence volunteered for a medical study that involved test subjects being exposed to gamma rays. As a result, Florence became a gamma-mutated creature that was constantly in a state of anger, unable to return to her human form as her rage continued to grow. Eventually, she would come into conflict with She-Hulk and nearly destroy Las Vegas during their ensuing fight, showing that the Abominatrix is not to be messed with. 
Coming in at number 9, we have Bert Horowitz, aka the super genius villain known as Omnibus. Following an incident in which the leader detonated a gamma bomb inside a small town in the middle of Arizona, a local salesman named Bert Horowitz found himself rapidly becoming more intelligent by the minute, a similar mutation to the villain who had detonated the gamma bomb in the first place. In fact, when the leader was believed to be dead for a time, Bert took the name of Omnibus and replaced the leader's position in his massive spy network, becoming a new foe that the Incredible Hulk would have to deal with until the true leader finally returned to take back what was rightfully his. Coming in at number 8, we have the very unfortunately named Jailbait, aka Jesse Harrison, turned into a gamma mutant during the same gamma bomb event in Arizona that also spawned Omnibus. Jesse not only gained the traditional green skin and enhanced strength, but also possessed the ability to generate psionic blasts and force fields, depending on her level of concentration. And while Jesse's story was recently shown to have ended in tragedy during the Immortal Hulk series, for a long time she stood strong as one of the guardians of the leader's freehold paradise, another green goliath for the Hulk to have to battle. Coming in at number 7, we have the evil Patchwork, a serial killer that somehow manages to be even more depraved than Carnage and Cletus Cassidy combined. Patchwork was one of the very first villains ever faced by Doc Samson, when the doctor decided to do some solo superheroing and proved to be a worthy opponent. Using the gamma radiation oozing off his body to murder innocent women and make horrific sculptures with them, Patchwork was an incredibly durable and strong foe once he came face to face with a gamma power equal, and proved to be a worthy first opponent to be defeated by Doc Samson. Coming in at number 6, we have Tony Masterson, aka Half-Life. Living most of his life as a quiet college professor, Tony's life was forever changed when he accidentally fell victim to a gamma bomb experiment, being conducted by S.H.I.E.L.D. The explosion bleached his skin a ghostly green and convinced Tony that he had died and was now a walking corpse. Giving himself the name Half-Life, the villain was a worthy foe for the Hulk after being manipulated by the leader, and had the unique ability to drain the life force of his enemies through touch alone, like some sort of gamma-infused vampire or ghoul. This meant that the Hulk had to be a bit more creative when it came to fighting him, as punching Half-Life would only wind up giving him more power. Coming in at number 5, we have Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, aka the Red Hulk. Now, we did also have this guy on our list about most powerful Gamma heroes, but considering how his story started out, he definitely also counts for the villain list. Following the death of his daughter after years of pursuing the Hulk, Ross was manipulated by MODOK and several other supervillains into becoming the Red Hulk, in case his nemesis should ever return from his exile in outer space. Following the Hulk's return and defeat, the new Red Hulk began causing damage across the the globe, even getting into a fight with Thor on the moon and causing an earthquake in San Francisco from the sheer force of him jumping back to Earth. All in all, the Red Hulk definitely caused some major destruction. Coming in at number 4, we have Emil Blonsky, aka Abomination, a Croatian spy during the Cold War undercover on the same military base where Bruce Banner became the Hulk, Blonsky was the victim of a second gamma experiment when he foolishly activated the reactor on his own. Transformed into a green creature with claws even deadlier than the Hulk, Blonsky took the name Abomination once he realized he could not return to human form, and his days as an incognito spy were over. Stronger and with the healing factor on par with the Hulk. Abomination is a twisted look at what gamma radiation can do to someone who's already a trained killer. Coming in at number 3, we have Maestro, a twisted and evil version of the Hulk from a possible alternate future, giving himself a new name after conquering what remains of America following a nuclear winter in this dark future. This version of the Hulk has become far stronger than his original gamma green form, with years of sucking up deadly radiation only improving his ferocity and his power. When the real Hulk encountered this warlord version of himself, the only way he was able to finally come out on top was by literally warping the maestro back in time to be killed by the same gamma bomb that created the Hulk back in the 60s. But even since then, this future version of the Hulk still seems to keep finding ways to return and claim dominion over the world that he claims he deserves to rule. Coming in at number 2, we have Samuel Stearns, aka The Leader. Many people throughout the Marvel Universe can claim to be geniuses, but only The Leader has the unbelievably tall skull to seemingly prove it. Born a simple blue-collar American worker until an accident doused 
estrogen and gamma radiation, Samuel found himself getting the opposite of most other gamma mutates powers. Instead of becoming incredibly strong, he became incredibly smart, gaining an increased head size as his intellect, ego and ambition all swelled. No matter how powerful and strong most of the Hulk's enemies may seem, few can compare to the terrifying genius of the leader when he's fully unleashed, as his plans have nearly destroyed or conquered the world on countless occasions, and have only been able to be stopped by the Hulk and Bruce Banner trying to use his own genius-like intellect. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have the most powerful Gamma being of all, because he's the source of all of them. That's right, it's the one below all, residing in the very lowest point of reality at the very bottom of the multiverse. The one below all is the ultimate personification of destruction and hate, essentially being the Hulk-esque alter ego of the one above all, the divine creator of the entire Marvel multiverse. The one below all is the source of all Gamma radiation, as it uses the energy source to gain access to other worlds across the multiverse, and resurrect gamma related beings if they die after becoming connected to the one below all. Even with all of the crazy additions to the Hulk's mythology in the past few years, the one below all is perhaps the greatest, most powerful addition of all time. And who knows what the future holds for the creator of Gamma itself. Coming in at number 10, we have the evil sorcerer Watan. One of the arch enemies of the classic DC hero Dr. Fate, Watan is a green skinned magic wielder that has managed to fight Dr. Fate over the ages by constantly reincarnating themselves into a new body and form after each defeat, seemingly incapable of having their spirit totally destroyed. Originally a woman from the Stone Age who had trained in black magic, and also rumored to be connected to a Viking goddess, Watan is one of the oldest villains throughout all of DC Comics history, and will likely continue to be a magical thorn in Dr. Fate's side for the rest of time. Coming in at number 9, we have Eclipso, the former Wrath of God. A supernatural agent of chaos with his face permanently in the shade of a constant eclipse, Eclipso claimed to be the one who carried out the biblical flood of Noah's Ark, and that he was replaced in his position as the physical embodiment of God's wrath by the specter because Eclipso was simply too violent and angry for the role. Older than almost every other being on Earth, Eclipso has fought many heroes over the years, and even though he no longer possesses the power of a full god, he is still an extremely dangerous magical being, and who knows what he'll try to do next to regain his godly power. Coming in at number 8, we've got Black Adam. Born 5,000 years ago as a slave in the country of Kandok, Adam was gifted the powers of all the gods similarly to how Billy Batson would be several millennia later. However, after freeing himself and the other slaves, Adam wasn't content to lead a life of peace, instead choosing to become the violent leader of Kandok and ruling with an iron fist. Horrified at the destruction being caused by his powers, the wizard Shazam within the Rock of Eternity sealed away Black Adam for thousands of years, choosing to wait for a more suitable heir to all of his power. Of course, once Black Adam was unleashed once again by the research of Dr. Savannah, he was dead set on getting back the position of power that he believes Billy Batson has unjustly stolen from him. Coming in at number 7, we have the Enchantress. And to be more specific, we're talking about the Enchantress known as June Moon from the DC Universe, and not the Enchantress from Marvel's Thor comics, although honestly, either Enchantress could probably earn a spot on this list. In this case, the Enchantress is a dark, magical personality that was awakened within the young artist June Moon, transforming her physically into a magic-wielding sorceress whenever she chooses to call upon its power, or during moments of great emotional turmoil. Oil. And while June herself likely doesn't count as a supervillain, given that she generally wants what's best for everyone, but the actual Enchantress entity? She's a being of pure destruction, and only June's strength of will is capable of holding her back. Coming in at number 6, we have the Marvel entity known as Nightmare. One of the Fear Lords, a group of demons that gain their power from human suffering and misery, Nightmare has been a longtime villain of Doctor Strange, 
Cage, and any other Marvel hero that dares to wander into the magical realm of sleep. Capable of bringing any sleeping person's astral form into his nightmare realm, Nightmare is one of the few Marvel villains that relies almost entirely on mental manipulation and tricks, as he's much weaker if he's ever brought into the physical waking world. Even with this limitation, Nightmare is a ruthless foe, and is always searching for another way to bring everyone in existence into his dark world of fitful slumber. Coming in at number 5, we've got another Marvel demon with the infamous Mephisto. Perhaps best known for being behind the One More Day event that saw Spider-Man's marriage with Mary Jane Parker get wiped from the timeline, Mephisto is one of the closest things that the Marvel Universe has to a Satan character, and uses humanity's belief in a devil to inspire even more fear in his powers. Extremely powerful and considered a Class 2 demon, Mephisto often finds himself in conflict with some of the more magical or even cosmic heroes of this universe, although his preferred method of work is manipulating events from afar. And with Mephisto having recently become a major player in Spider-Man lore again as the true reasoning behind his obsession with Peter Parker's marriage is slowly being revealed, we definitely haven't seen the last of the Marvel Universe's devil. Coming in at number 4, we have Baron Mordo. A student of the mystical Ancient One for decades before Doctor Stephen Strange even injured his hands, Baron Karl Mordo was long suspected by the Ancient One as having an impure heart, but nevertheless was taught magic as a potential next Sorcerer Supreme. However, Mordo's ambitions for power were too great and he was banished from the Ancient One's sanctum for contacting the dread entity called Dormammu. With Doctor Stephen Strange being trained in his place as a Sorcerer Supreme, specifically to stop any future plans of Mordo's, the Baron embraced his role as a magical villain and has been a persistent an enemy of Strange and his allies ever since. Coming in at number 3, we have the demonic Trigon the Terrible. Hailing from the dimension of Azeroth, Trigon is best known as being the evil father of Raven, one of the key members of the Teen Titans. Born from the darkness shed from humanity inside his own dimension, Trigon sought to have a child tethering him to the earthly realm, and thus seduced Raven's mother while in an angelic disguise. With Raven having become a hero determined to use her magic to fight against her father's wishes, Trigon has become one of the largest threats the Teen Titans, or even the rest of the DC Universe, have ever faced, and in recent years has been building up a new army from within his hellish dimension. Coming in at number 2, we have the Lord of Dread himself, Dormammu. The true nemesis of Doctor Stephen Strange, Dormammu is literally millions of years old, and born from a realm of pure magic before eventually conquering the vast expanse known as the Dark Dimension, a reality without time, and combined his own magic with that of the entire Dark Realm. With the Baron Mordo acting as his earthly disciple, Dormammu has long wished to conquer Earth and expand his domain, with only the efforts of Doctor Strange having been successful in holding him back so far. With his magic even being powerful enough to alter the spells of Odin the Allfather, Dormammu is one of the most powerful magical beings in the entire Marvel Multiverse. But hold that thought though, because finally coming in at our top spot, we have the infamous Victor Von Doom. Now, when you think of Doctor Doom, you might think of his more scientist-esque depictions in the movies, or his many uses of technology in the comics as the leader of Latveria, such as his army of Doombots. However, the true danger of Doctor Doom is in his utilization of both technology and magic together, as the Fantastic Four's nemesis has long been a powerful sorcerer alongside his technical genius and power as the leader of a country. Introduced to the mystical arts by his own mother, Doom has proven to be so adept at magic that he was even briefly considered as a potential Sorcerer Supreme. However, given that he often uses his magic for kinda evil purposes, it's probably for the best if Doctor Doom just remains a doctor for the time being. 
and a 10 Baron Blood. Lord John Falsworth was the youngest of two sons of Lord William Falsworth, one of the wealthiest members of the British aristocracy in late Victorian and Edwardian times. John left embittered when his older brother Montgomery inherited the title and the bulk of his estate upon William's death, shortly before World War I. Eventually, Falsworth sought the castle Dracula in Romania in order to find and control the Dracula as a means of achieving immense wealth and power. However, Falsworth fell victim to Dracula's hypnotic powers because you know he's a vampire and was turned into a vampire himself. Dracula bid Falsworth to return to England to wreak havoc upon the country that had repulsed him earlier. Although Falsworth's activities remained largely unrevealed during this time, at some point he again offered his services to the emerging fascist regime in Germany. That's right folks, we got a... <laughs> can't really say it. German scientists performed painful experiments which enabled him to avoid his vulnerability to direct sunlight, and during World War II, German intelligence once again sent Falsworth to England to continue a new reign of terror. Wonderful. And a 9 Batman. Bruce Wayne died when the vigilante Batman was turned into a vampire. With now only one side of his dual life to take care of, the vampire haunts the knights, frightening and biting criminals. With most of the vampires being destroyed, Batman confronted Dracula and killed him by impaling the ancient vampire on a tree that was destroyed by lightning. However, the victory came at a cost, because during the fight Dracula successfully drained the last of Batman's blood, destroying his humanity. Nonetheless, Batman retained his sense of self and assured Alfred that only Bruce Wayne had died, the Batman will live on. And thanks to his new vampiric powers, he would be able to protect Gotham City forever. Because, you know, immortality. Not only that though, but then Batman went on to turn the other Justice League members into vampires. Batman lost his supernatural companion of a vampirized Catwoman when she took a fatal crossbow bolt that was aimed at him. Overcome with rage over the death of the only person able to control his bloodlust, Batman killed the Joker and drained all his blood, which only led to more draining. In a date, Zaris. Zaris is the son of Dracula. Angry with humanity, encroaching into vampire territory, and unhappy with his father's leadership, Zaris created a secret alliance with the leaders of various va vampire sects. The Claw Sect, which was warriors, the Charnaputra Sect, Mystico Sect, Nosferatu Sect, Atlantean Sect, the Moshka Sect, and the Siren Sect, all to overthrow his father. He accomplished this at the Centennial Meeting of the Vampires. Yeah, they have a meeting every hundred years. He and his allies drove stakes into Dracula and cut his head off. And his allies, like Mysticos, invented devices which cancelled the frequencies of light that were harmful to vampires. So Zaris decided to use these devices to create a new, more dominant place in the world for vampires. He gave these devices to his allies so they could stage a raid on Krieger Sect's fortress, eliminating their senior leadership. A vampire with devices that cancel out what the vampire Empire's weaknesses are? <laughs> no thanks. In at number 7, Harkon Volkahar. Lord Volkahar is actually the main antagonist of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's DLC, Dawnguard's main storyline. This vampire lord is not only a vampire, but he can also shapeshift into a vampire lord form that gives him a boost to all of his abilities and magics. Lord Volkahar once read a prophecy about a bow that could blot out the sun permanently, causing Skyrim to be a land free for vampires to roam. But to complete this prophecy, he needs Oriel's bow, which is technically also known as Akatosh's bow since Oriel is just the elven name for Akatosh, and a daughter of Cold Harbor, which is a pure-blooded vampire made by the Daedric Lord Molag Ball after a, um, let's call it a ritual. This nearly came to fruition when you brought him both the bow and his own daughter before your final battle, so if you didn't end up winning, you'd be handing this vampiric lord everything he needs to take over Skyrim, so yeah, it's pretty messed up. And that's even if you don't become a vampire lord in the storyline, which you also can do. However, you end up still having to kill Harkin anyway since he doesn't really need you anymore etc so yeah pretty powerful dude unless you have like a 100 archery school and at six the flash Barry Allen aka the flash is one of the former heroes who turned into a bloodthirsty vampire after Batman spread the vampiric plague throughout the world of Earth 43 he confronts Wally West from a different world and attempts to kill him however before he can succeed he was killed by Roy Harper from his world who shot him with wooden arrows in the back 
because you know it's like wooden stakes. <laughs> but even if he went down easily, that does not mean he wasn't powerful, since you know, a vampire with the powers of the Flash, and not just any Flash, but Barry Allen, the literal speed force himself, basically. Yeah, I don't think you really need to see why that's absolutely terrifying. If he hadn't have been killed by Roy, he would have wiped out humanity, and I think that's the reason why he had to be killed so that that didn't happen because there is literally no way to defend against that especially since Batman the one who always has a plan to stop Justice League members was the one who turned him so there's no one really to fight him now halfway through into number five Morbius First being introduced in Amazing Spider-Man number 101 in 1971, Dr. Michael Morbius was a scientist born in Greece who became a Nobel Prize winning biochemist. He suffered from a blood disease and developed an experimental treatment in an effort to cure it. Its side effects though turned him into a vampire adjacent who needs to consume blood in order to survive, and gain typical vampire characteristics such as an aversion to sunlight and the powers of flight, enhanced strength, speed, and a healing factor. His overall appearance changed as well. He gained fangs, his nose flattened to appear more bat-like, and his skin became extremely pale, like me. But he has less of a nose and sharper teeth. Additionally, the victims of his bite would turn into living vampires themselves, which is absolutely nuts. This character also made an appearance in the 90s Spider-Man animated series, which is literally my favorite thing in the world. However, since it was a kid's show, he couldn't consume blood, so instead he consumed plasma. And his origin was changed as well, so it could kind of be intertwined with Peter's. When he spliced his DNA with Peter Parker's, you're using the Neurogenic Recombinator, and then a bat jumped in front of the ray. And for Dracula. In Marvel Comics, Count Dracula is a centuries old vampire, sorcerer, and Transylvanian nobleman who rules from his namesake fortress known as Castle Dracula. He is the supreme ruler and world's most powerful vampire. Originally the Wallachian ruler Vlad the Impaler, he turned himself into a vampire following a battle with the invading Ottoman Empire, seeking revenge to, you know, destroy his enemies, because of course. Driven by a lust for power, companionship, and blood, his centuries of undead existence have brought him into conflict with vampires hunters, other immortals, and in the modern age, superheroes. Dracula has a vast network of loyal servants, cultists, brides, and minions who regularly assist him and attempt to resurrect him if he actually ends up dying. Recently, Dracula and his followers have taken up refuge in Chernobyl, creating a new vampire nation and bringing him into conflict with the Avengers. But given that like, he's in essence the original vampire, I feel like he deserves to be on this list. Also in the Marvel Universe, his name is Vlad, which just makes me think think of Vlad Plasmius from Danny Phantom, and I love Danny Phantom, so. Getting close to the end, in at number three, Ultraman. Ultraman was turned into a vampire by Batman, which doesn't really make sense because he's a Kryptonian, so like, without kryptonite fangs, how did Batman pierce his skin, but you know, whatever. Ultraman, along with many supermen of the multiverse, were kidnapped by the prophecy to steal their powers, but they were freed by the Justice Incarnate. Later on, Ultraman confronted Wally West from a different world, along with the Flash, and attempted to kill him, but Wally managed to knock him down with his super speed fist and hold him down with dozens of wooden stakes. And while he seemingly was defeated by those wooden stakes, I don't think you need an explanation as to why a Superman with vampire powers is a bad idea. Okay, that's horrifying. Although this does beg the question, does it cancel out like the whole sun powers thing? Since like vampires are weak to sunlight, but Superman uses the yellow sun to get his powers? Or is it just like that a Kryptonian vampire is double weak to a red sun? Cause he's already double weak to a red sun, but does that mean that like he doesn't really have powers? I don't know. It's an interesting debate that I believe you should have in the comments, but respectfully. Can't believe I, I'm saying that because no one's gonna listen. Who am I kidding? But ultimately, in at number two, the Alpha Vampire. In the world of Supernatural, the Alpha Vampire was the very first vampire and basically father of all other vampires. He was one of the Alpha monsters captured and interrogated by Crowley and Castiel in their efforts to locate Purgatory. He escaped Crowley's prison though and set up a new nest in North Dakota and then Montana. He was later tracked down for his blood for the weapon to defeat the Leviathans and, and ultimately recognizing a common enemy, he actually gave the Winchesters his blood without a fight. During an attack on the British Men of Letters though, the Alpha a vampire was killed by Sam Winchester with the cult, like the demon cult that can for some reason kill literally everything. 
I don't know how, but whatever. The Alpha Vampire is first glimpsed briefly flashing in the minds of his uh, children as it's commanding them to recruit more of his army in like season 6. Nothing is known about this particular monster aside from the fact that its messages can be heard by all other vampires and he can also just knock him out if he wants to. Dean ends up seeing this vision while he is infected, but yeah, the daddy of all other vamps, <laughs> that's a powerful boy. Finally, in at number 1, Varney. Varney was a human or gigantopithecus sorcerer that once lived in like 10,000 BC. Varney served in the cult of the Darkholders under Thusla Doom. Injured due to the actions of King Cull of Valsia, a dying Varney was transformed into a vampire by sorcerers of the pre-cataclysmic Atlantis because he was born in Atlantis. He allegedly was the last survivor among the vampires created in Atlantis before the Great Cataclysm, and ruled over Earth's vampires. But in 1459, tired of his ages long existence, Varney chose Dracula as his successor and lord of Earth's vampires, and imparted much of his supernatural power to him by forcing Dracula to drink his blood. Varney then committed suicide by exposing himself to direct sunlight. However, years later, Marie Laveau, desperate for vampire blood, had kidnapped Doctor Strange's friend Morgana Blessing and his brother Victor. Strange was about to deliver the spell page to Laveau when reason reasserted itself and he forever banished the page from Earth. Basically, Laveau, possessing the Darkhold, though, invoked a spell contained within for resurrecting the Lord of the Vampires. So yeah, the very first vampire of all time in the Marvel Universe, who killed himself with sunlight and then was resurrected, and also made Dracula, yeah that's a number one for sure, there's no contest, even from the alpha vamp, no way.